church family, if you have a copy of God's Word with you, I want to invite you to find your place in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and this morning we're going to look at verses 13 through 17 as I continue preaching on the series, Keeping Christ in Christmas. One has said concerning Jesus, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the most dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. And this Christmas season, we're looking at Matthew's gospel, and the stories or narratives that Matthew shares at the beginning of his gospel concerning the birth of Jesus. We're in danger sometimes in American Christianity and modern Christianity of taking the stories related to Jesus' birth and making them uh, the subject of sentimental spirituality. Uh, Just focusing on this idea of a cute baby in a manger. And indeed, Matthew depicts Jesus as being a baby in a manger. Luke does the same as well. But it's important to remember the purpose of all of these stories related to the birth and early years of Jesus. The gospel writers first wanted to portray Jesus as being the fulfillment of ancient scripture. As early as Genesis 3.15, God announced that he had a plan to deal with our sins. One would come from woman who would give liberty from sin and all of its consequences and the most important consequence is that of spiritual death alienation from God so the gospel writers told about Jesus birth because before first century Jews they needed to defend this Messiah Jesus as being the fulfillment of all the stuff we find in the Old Testament but secondly the gospel writers told about Jesus' early days because they wanted to impart great theological, doctrinal, biblical truth about Jesus. They wanted to show, if you will, why Jesus had to come to earth. And so this morning we come to a passage that contains the baptism of Jesus. May seem like a strange passage for Christmas morning It's important to note that the gospel writer saw this as the last event in Jesus' early life and they saw it as the first event in his public ministry. This event is where Jesus transitioned from obscurity to popularity. This event is where Jesus transitioned from his younger years to the years of his public ministry. So we come to Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. And I believe a fitting passage here on Christmas morning, as this passage reminds us so clearly and succinctly of why Jesus came to earth. If you have a copy of God's word with you and you're physically able, I invite you to stand to honor the reading of God's word. Matthew says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Jesus answered him, Allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John allowed him to be baptized. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water The heaven suddenly opened for him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Father, in Jesus' name, we now look into your word and we're thankful for your great design of human salvation. And we ask by your Spirit during this time, enlighten our thinking Help us to understand great and wonderful things from your word. Move in our hearts and where there are hearts that are stony, icy, and cold at times, would you give us warm and receptive hearts to your word? 
And Lord, allow this time in your word to be transformational for our own good and for your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Matthew in verse 13 speaks of Jesus coming to be baptized. The language in the original language of the text is language of purpose. Matthew was intentional to depict Jesus as coming with a purpose to be baptized. When we read Luke's gospel, we discover that many at this time were coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. Matthew's gospel earlier depicts people coming to John, Matthew 3, 6, to be baptized, confessing their sins. Notice that the confession of sins is closely related to the purpose of baptism. So this brings us to the great question, why did Jesus have to be baptized? Jesus didn't have sin. Jesus was completely righteous. Jesus never violated any of God's holy laws. Why did he have to be baptized if baptism was for sinners? Well, Jesus was baptized to identify with sinners. Jesus was baptized to show he came to earth to bring salvation to sinners like us. As Jesus said in Luke 19.10, this was his purpose in life. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And so Jesus' baptism reminds us that Jesus came to earth because he was and is a Savior for sinners. So this morning we're talking about keeping Christ and Christmas, and we want to focus on this passage of the subject, Jesus, a Savior for sinners. It's so important that we are aware of and understand this aspect of our Lord's ministry. Jesus was not just a religious leader. He wasn't just a figurehead. He wasn't a political leader. He wasn't merely just a good moral example. He wasn't one of many religious teachers who just came and gave his version, his brand of religion, his perspective on God. No, he was God. He was the God-man who lived amongst us. Totally God, totally man, living and dying for our sins. In this passage, really highlights these realities and it's so important we're aware of these things this Christmas. There may be some of us here this morning who have never embraced Christ as Savior. It's needful for you to see Jesus as a Savior for sinners because your soul is at stake in these things. This is how you know God, salvation, and eternal life. Jesus Christ Son of God, Son of Man, living and dying for sins. Even for those of us who are in Christ, sometimes the gospel can seem like an old, old story. However, the gospel is our means of living the Christian life. We receive power to overcome sin. We receive power for joy in life through an ever-present awareness of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. It is Hebrews 12, 1 through 2, looking unto Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. It is looking unto Jesus that gives us power for Christian living and for all of our responsibilities as God's people. Some find little power for Christian service and sanctification because their eyes are set on themselves and not on the Savior. And these things as well, I believe, can help awaken us from spiritual apathy and lethargy. When our eyes are on Christ and all he's really done for us, it'll do something to stir the fires of devotion in our hearts. So Jesus' baptism teaches us a lot about Christ's work as a savior for sinners. 
The question this morning from this text is, what does Jesus' baptism teach us about Christ's work on behalf of sinners? And I think we see here four truths or four realities about Christ's work on behalf of sinners from Jesus' baptism. And I want us to look at these this morning. Number one, Jesus' baptism reminds us that we are lawbreakers by nature. Now, that's kind of strong language, you know. We're lawbreakers by nature. Maybe that's not what you expected to hear on Christmas morning. Merry Christmas. You're a lawbreaker by nature. Well, I think we see this reality really pressed home in the baptism event. Look at what verse 14 says. It says, when Jesus came, John tried to stop him. The language means to prevent or to hinder. You all know we have a new puppy because I've talked about him a couple of times. The puppy loves me. He follows me around. But it's like when I walk, he has this way of always walking right in front of me and getting in my way. If you hear that I've had a great fall and I've broken a hip or a shoulder or something, I'm in the hospital, it's likely got something to do with this puppy that's always underneath my feet physically preventing my movement. Many believe this is strong language here. It speaks of a continual action in the past. It's like John over and over again was arguing with Jesus, no, you can't be baptized by me. I'm stopping you. I'm preventing you. Why did John try to prevent Jesus from being baptized by him? Why did John not want to baptize Jesus? Well, if you were to study the Gospels, you would see John, first of all, wasn't flippant in how he administered baptism. John was choosy and picky. He wanted to make sure that people first, before they were baptized, gave evidence that they were truly saved. He called people, he said, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. During the Puritan age, the Puritans called this the regulative principle in worship. When it comes to worship, when it comes to the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, Sure, we don't want to be self-righteous, but we should have an air of holy caution about us wherein we remember the purpose, the significance, and the symbolic meaning of these things. And we see precedent for such choosiness and pickiness in Scripture. John the Baptist was choosy and picky about who would be baptized. He wanted to know people made a true profession of faith. And the early church, the apostles, the apostles as well were choosy and picky when it came to baptism. So that's one reason that John was, John stopped or prevented Jesus. A second reason is this, John was familiar with Jesus' character. He was familiar with Jesus' character. If you were to read Matthew 3, 1 through 12, he had depicted himself as being unworthy to unlatch the ties of Jesus' sandals. In the first century world, this was a, this was a custom for servants or slaves in a household. There was one normally designated for unlatching or untying the sandals of guests when they arrived at a house and then washing their feet John knew the character of Jesus. He knew that Jesus was a holy and righteous man. He perhaps received divine special revelation telling him this is the Messiah. So John, John was leery at the idea of baptizing Jesus because he knew this is a holy, righteous man believed to be the Messiah. So he tried to stop and prevent Jesus. But Jesus said in verse 15, look at Jesus' words. Jesus said, allow it for now because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. The language allow it for now could be translated, it is proper. 
Jesus was saying, this is the right thing to do. This is proper for me to be baptized. Why? Jesus said, we need to do this to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. Jesus had to be baptized because he came to fulfill the righteous requirements of God's law on behalf of God's people. See, here is the reality God has a moral law for human beings. God has a moral law for his creation. This moral law is based on his character. There's many nowadays who like to detach all mention of law from the Christian faith. You can't remove God's moral law from human creation, the Christian faith, any more than you could change God's character. God is a holy God. He is perfectly righteous. And on the basis of his righteous nature, he has made us to live lives that reflect his righteous character. And with that, he has given a moral law based on his character that describes how we live in relationship with him. I'm sorry, what's going on with this microphone? Does anybody, is it mine that's making this noise? It must be. Can I just have a handheld and we can figure this out later maybe? Thank you. I appreciate that, Don. I appreciate all that our tech team does. So I was letting a little um, scruffle, is that what you call it, grow out? Maybe that was messing with the microphone. <laughs> Teach the preacher you need to shave, all right. But Laura likes this, all right. <laughs> so anyways, back to Jesus' baptism, the law of God, and righteousness. So... God has this moral character, this moral law. And, and here's why Jesus came to earth, because we're, we are all lawbreakers by nature. We've all violated God's law. You know, you have the law of God, perhaps, most simply sta stated in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments teach us that we're to have no other gods before the Lord, that we're not to live for carved images or material things, that we're not to take the name of the Lord in vain, that we're not to violate the Lord's principle of Sabbath rest, that we're to honor our father and mother. The Ten Commandments teach us that we're uh, not to murder, we're not to commit adultery, we're not to steal, we're not to bear false witness, and we're not to covet. Some would say, None of that has any bearing on our lives nowadays as Christians. We're, we're free from all of that. Well, the religious leaders in Jesus' day mistook his ministry as doing away with the law as well. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, Don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Study the teaching ministry of Jesus and that great Sermon on the Mount. He indicated that we should fulfill God's moral law. That's why he, he said things like, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. I say to you, whoever lusts after a woman commits adultery with her in his heart. And so Jesus was indicating God's moral law. God still desires humans, even in the New Testament age, to live according to this moral law. Paul indicated this as well. He talked about how he was finally convicted of sin and made aware of his need for salvation. He said it was that 10th commandment. In Romans, he said this. It was that 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet, that convicted him of sin. He realized that he had violated God's moral law, that he was a covetous person. And when he realized he was a covetous person, he saw his need for Christ. We're lawbreakers by nature. And Jesus even indicated that it's his desire for us to fulfill God's law. When he gave that important great commandment, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so you will fulfill all the law and the prophets. 
So get this, in this lawless age in which we live in, Christianity isn't against God's moral law. Christianity just teaches you this. You don't have the power to keep God's moral law on your own. You needed God to do something for you. And God did this. He sent Jesus Christ 100% 100% God, 100% man. Jesus never sinned. He never violated God's law. He lived a perfect, righteous, perfectly righteous life on behalf of lawbreakers like us. And then he died as a sacrifice for our sins. We're lawbreakers by nature, by ourselves. We have no capacity to have a relationship with the holy God Because we've all violated God's moral law in innumerable ways. Apart from Christ, we're perpetually in a state of sin, unable to do anything to please God or reconcile ourselves to God. Paul said it like this in Romans 3.10. There's no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Solomon asked in the Proverbs, who can say I've kept my heart pure, I'm cleansed from my sin? And the answer would be no one. And Solomon at the dedication of the temple, 1 Kings 8, 46, said there is no one who does not sin. So this is why Jesus came to earth. Because we have violated God's law in innumerable ways. And Jesus went to be baptized and he said, allow it for now because this is the way for us to fulfill all righteousness. This is what Jesus was doing as he began his earthly ministry. He was baptized, associating himself with sinners, lawbreakers like us, and demonstrating he was the law keeper who came to live and die on our behalf. I'm an assistant coach this year in Cartersville City Basketball League and uh, Levi's playing and I'm just the assistant coach there to help and but I still have to go through all of this testing and training with the city that they have for coaches and I got an email just a couple of days ago and they said hey you forgot to take our child abuse prevention online test it'll take you two hours you've got to read this material then take quizzes and so I put my speed reading skills to test tried to take it serious right got to be able to spot child abuse if I see it but one thing this test said was hey as as coaches remember as you work with kids to to use tactics of communication that will make them feel comfortable on this test advised when you're coaching and dealing with kids and if you sense there's a especially if you sense there's an issue with the kid make sure that you as an adult get down on the level with that kid and look in their eyes be careful that you don't seem like this tall towering figure over the child get down on their level as you communicate with them And what a picture of what Jesus did in the gospel for us. He came down to our level on earth and he embraced sin on our behalf. Even though we are all imperfect, finite, sinful lawbreakers, Jesus associated with us through his baptism, through his life, death, and resurrection to give us the forgiveness of sins To give us real life with God. We're lawbreakers by nature. But this event of Jesus' baptism also teaches us that Jesus was an innocent sacrifice for sinners. Look at how the story continues in verse 16. It says, when Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. Notice the heavens being open in biblical tradition. This was a symbol of great divine revelation. Ezekiel 1.1, the prophet Ezekiel saw the heavens open. The heavens are open. 
This is an indicator that God's about to do something big in his plan of redemption. The fact that God was doing something big was further symbolized by the Spirit of God. The third person of the Trinity descending like a dove upon Jesus. Now in Old Testament times prior to Pentecost, the Spirit of God came upon God's people when God had set apart a person for a special work. Think of people like Gideon in Judges 6.34, Samson in Judges 14.6, Saul in 1 Samuel 11.6, David in 1 Samuel 16.13. The Spirit of God also came upon God's prophets at times. Such was the case with Ezekiel in Ezekiel 2, 1 through 5. So remember, Matthew's readers were primarily Jewish. When they hear the Spirit of God came upon Jesus at Jesus' baptism, they know in their Old Testament minds, this is a sign that Jesus has been set apart for a very special work. On top of these things, Hebrew prophecy had said that the Spirit of God would come upon the Messiah in great power. Isaiah 11, 1 through 9, Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, and Isaiah 62, 1 through 2. We read later in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 4, 1, we're taught that the Spirit of God actually comforted, assisted, and sustained Jesus throughout his earthly ministry. Romans 8, 11 teaches us that it was the Spirit of God that raised Jesus on Easter Sunday. The Holy Spirit performed the resurrection. Now, for purpose of our message this morning, let's look at this fact that the Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dove. How many of y'all remember high school English? Say, oh me. You don't have to say, oh me. If you want to say amen, you can say amen. If you're one of those English snobs who did so well in high school English. But do you remember being taught this thing called a simile? Sim a simile is drawing a comparison using like or as. It's important that we note here in the English this dove, this reference to a dove, uses a simile. It uses the word like. So this isn't a literal dove. This is the gospel writer trying to depict what he saw. He saw something come from heaven and light or fall upon Jesus' shoulder or body. And the best way he could describe it is that this apparition looked like a dove. Now this is what it looked like to human eyes. Human eyes trying to describe what was seen. It looked like a dove. But there was great symbolic meaning in the appearance of something that looked like a dove. We'll find later in Matthew's Gospel, in Matthew 10, 16, that a dove in the first century Jewish world was a symbol of innocence. You remember when Jesus sent out his disciples to minister, he told them, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So the symbol communicated the idea of harmlessness and innocence. Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, 29. He was innocent. But from the Old Testament, we learned that these birds, doves, were used in the Old Testament sacrifices for guilt. There was actually Leviticus 5, 7. I know Leviticus isn't our most beloved book of the Bible for devotional reading. But there was this offering in Leviticus 5, 7. If you were guilty of a sin or a trespass against another, the required offering and the guilt offering was a dove. So for Jews in Jesus' day, this symbol of a dove communicated, number one, innocence, and number two, the removal of guilt. 
And so we learn great truth from Jesus' baptism concerning Jesus' mission in life. Jesus was the innocent, spotless, sinless Lamb of God who came to take away our sins. Make sure you get this point of Christian truth. There's a form of Christianity out there. We could call it liberal Christianity that says Jesus taught a lot of good things, but we can't believe all the miracles. We have to doubt some of the history. Liberal Christianity would say at the end of the day, Jesus was a man who was spiritually enlightened and he understood a lot of things about God and life and he gave a lot of good observations and teachings. And if we'll just follow his teachings and kind of overlook the silly mythical folklore, Jesus is one of many paths to God. And so we can call ourselves Christians and even meet in a church and Sing to Christ and rejoice because of his good teaching. That's liberal Christianity. There's also prosperity Christianity in America, and it's being spread on the mission field that would say Jesus is a path for you to experience your most prosperous life. Follow Jesus and follow his principles, and the Lord can enrich you and prosper you. On top of this, there's a form of Christianity. I would call it self-help Christianity. We could view it as like prosperity gospel light. It doesn't teach out and out prosperity gospel, but it's this idea that following Jesus can enhance your life. So follow Jesus, follow his principles, and you'll have a more successful more convenient life, a better life. These forms of Christianity overlook the gospel message that we are lawbreakers and that Jesus was an innocent sacrifice for sinners. This baptism story teaches us these realities. But number three this morning, it teaches us this. The work of Christian salvation is eternal in nature. Look at how the story concludes in verse 17. It says, And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Notice a voice from heaven. In Old Testament times, voices from heaven were often heard in times of great revelation. Of course, the question is, whose voice was this that was heard from heaven? Well, the voice was none other than the voice of the Lord. More specifically, it was the voice of the Heavenly Father. Between Jesus, the dove, and the voice from heaven, it's important to note that we see all three members of the Trinity present at Jesus' baptism. The Trinity is this doctrine that is, this teaching that is unique to Christianity. No other world religion has such a teaching. You can really categorize all world religions into three categories. There are uh, monotheistic world religions. These teach there is one God. There are polytheistic religions. These, These teach there are many gods. And then there are pantheistic religions. These teach that God is... Everything is God, or another version, God is in everything. Christianity is monotheistic. There is one God. But Christianity is different from other monotheistic religions that teach there's one God, in that it teaches God exists in three persons. God exists in three persons. Now, I personally have this conviction You have to believe that there is only one God. You can't believe in more than one God because there can only be one self-existent being. So there's one God. He is the Lord Jehovah Yahweh, but he exists in three persons. 
And here we see the three persons of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, all put on display in Jesus' baptism. There's a form of Christianity known as being Unitarian. It's theology. It teaches that there's just one God and there is no such thing as the Trinity. The Trinity is an invention of men. Well, you see evidence of the Trinity right here. Just as you see evidence of the Trinity at the beginning of time in creation. Before God the Father made all things, Scripture says in Genesis 1-2 that the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God, when God went about making humankind, he said, let us make man in our own image. The use of words like us and our were evidence of the Trinity. So you see the Trinity in creation. You see the Trinity in Jesus' baptism. And here we're reminded that salvation works like this. Jesus was the Savior of the world, sent by the Father, and sustained by the Spirit throughout his earthly ministry. This voice was heard from heaven. It gave witness to the presence of the Trinity in Jesus' baptism. The voice that made the declaration from heaven was that same voice, Genesis 3.15, that made the first gospel announcement in the Garden of Eden. A similar voice would be heard in Matthew 17.5 when Jesus was transfigured in front of his disciples. Ultimately, this voice was a fulfillment of Scripture. Psalm 2-7 had said concerning the Messiah, I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son, today I've become your father. So we see the miracle of fulfilled prophecy in Jesus once again. The way that he fulfilled so many Old Testament prophecies revealed is different than any other rabbi or any other religious leader. Miracle of miracles that Jesus fulfilled all the prophecy he did. So the voice from heaven indicated that Jesus was a fulfillment of prophecy. But the voice from heaven also gave evidence of the Trinity. All three persons of the Trinity being involved in Jesus' ministry. These things are important for us. We can have confidence because of the presence of the Trinity in Jesus' baptism, that our salvation is secure. Our salvation was designed by the Heavenly Father. Our salvation was accomplished by the Spirit. Or excuse me, our salvation was accomplished by the Son. And the Spirit of God had a part in all of these things. The Spirit of God moved prophets and apostles throughout history to announce God's plan of salvation and the Spirit comforted and sustained and even raised Jesus from the dead at his resurrection. And now the Bible teaches us that as believers we can have confidence that God is our Heavenly Father. We can pray to him, Matthew 6, 9, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We can have confidence that we have a Heavenly Father we can have confidence that the Son died for us. And we can have confidence that the Spirit is now with us. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 teaches us that when we are saved, the Spirit of God comes to live within our life and he functions like a seal. A seal that keeps us secured until the end of time when Christ returns. The work of Christian salvation is eternal in nature. Announced by God before time began. Accomplished by the Son of God in human history. And now the Spirit of God keeps us secure in our salvation. Number four, and I'll close with this this morning. Jesus' baptism teaches us that Christ makes us well-pleasing to God. 
so we talked about the voice from heaven, but notice exactly what the voice said in verse 17. It said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Why did God the Father see the need to say this about Jesus? Well, again, it's a fulfillment of prophecy, Psalm 2, 7. But he also said this to emphasize the eternal relationship that has always existed between God the Father and God the Son. Don't get the baptism story wrong. This isn't Jesus all of a sudden becoming God. No, the announcement from heaven indicated Jesus always was God. Some people struggle with the idea of a trinity. They can't get their mind around it. I can't understand it. Therefore, I'm doubting Christianity. Uh, let me help you out. You'll never understand it. This is one of the mysteries of our faith, God existing in three and one. But, I will say this, the Trinity is a necessity. How could God have love from the beginning of time if he had no one to share his love with? See, this is what the father meant when he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Before time ever began, there was perfect love between the three persons of the Trinity. And Jesus was there basking in the love of the father. So this statement, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, emphasized the eternal relationship between God the father and God the son but it also emphasized the sinlessness of Jesus. God was well pleased in Jesus because he was the perfect, spotless lamb of God who came to live and die for humanity's sin. The original language of the text depicts this settled and completed action. God saying, this is permanent. I am well pleased in my son. So he said he's well pleased because of the eternal relationship between God the Father and God the Son, but also because of Jesus' sinlessness and spotlessness. Now ultimately, this is great truth for us this Christmas, the fact that God was well pleased with his son means that we now are well pleasing to God because of Christ's work on our behalf. Because Jesus was well pleasing to God, we are now well pleasing to God. A great exchange has taken place. Jesus, the substitute, earned perfect righteousness for us. And so as one would say, as we hear the voice from heaven express his delight in Jesus, we must also hear the Father's verdict for us and delight in, as his son and daughters, his love for us. In Jesus, we too may be true sons of God and find that he delights in us. This was a permanent love. Because of Jesus, believers this Christmas have the eternal delight of the Father forever hanging over their lives. Those who are in Christ can have confidence that if they were to stand before God today, because of Jesus, God the Father could say, this is my beloved son or daughter with whom I'm well pleased. Paul said it like this in Romans, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. 
we were at Laura's parents house on the 23rd celebrating Christmas with her family and at some point somebody pulled out old picture books and the kids got to see our wedding pictures so like one of the first comments is oh look how young y'all looked and then the, the 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 one you always hear is wow look at how much hair dad had oh my goodness But then you know what it's like when you, as a married person, you see those old wedding pictures. You go back to that ceremony, the vows, this covenant commitment between God and friends and family. Most would say here this language, well pleased, has this idea of covenant permanence. And just as a husband and wife wed and commit to always love one another for better or worse, sickness and in health, God the Father says over you, believer, because of the Christmas story, God the Father says over you, I am well pleased. There is a covenant love that can never be removed because of the Christmas story.